Welcome everyone to our roundtable conversation today. My name is Jill Rao from the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. I'm here to introduce our wonderful guest today. First, we have Bishop Frank J. Duane of Venice. He is the former chairman of the Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development, which co-launched the Civilized Initiative from the USCCB. Next, we'll hear from Bishop Mario E. Dorsonville of Washington, D.C. He is the chairman of the Committee on Migration and Refugee Services. And thirdly, we have with us Mr. Andrew Musgrave. He is the Director of Catholic Social Action in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. He serves under Archbishop Dennis M. Schnur, under whose leadership Civilize It was created for a previous election cycle. And so let me just introduce briefly the topic of conversation today. As people of faith, we strive to imitate Jesus's model of encounter, love, and compassion. And this invitation to civility is more important than ever as we continue to urge our leaders to work together during a time of national crisis. On the individual level, we're called to civility in our virtual interactions with community members online during this time, as well as our interactions as we spend more time at home. So let's get started with our conversation. Let's begin with you, Bishop DeWayne. You launched the Civilized Initiative last year when you served as the chairman of the Committee on Domestic Justice and Human Development. What is Civilized about and why did the bishops feel that this initiative was necessary? First, I have to say it took a lot more than me to launch it. <laughs> many, many people, as you know, had a role in that, including yourself. So we're grateful to all who put it together. But why did we have to launch this, civilize it, dignity beyond the debate? I think we saw a real lack of any kind of civil model for treatment of other people when discussing political issues. It was like uh, you were a pit bull or you couldn't be involved in the discussion. You know, so I think we had to look to, in launching it, we looked at, okay, you have this lack of respect for dialogue. How do we turn that in then to a more civilized way of discourse? How do we touch upon it? And clearly something had to be done about that. And the bishops looked at it and in a broader kind of context, kind of, should we say, dialogue with society, what could be done. And I think they came up with the program and you're gonna talk locally where it was done before. But I think it's something we had to realize that, well, we're called to love our neighbor. We're called to respect one another. And we really believe out of our faith tradition that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. So we kind of put all that together. And I think in order to draw people into it rather than just lecture, uh, it was an idea to come up with a pledge. And the pledge re kind of revolved around three points. Civility uh, being one, uh, compassion, and also clarity. But if we look at that first, that civility, we had to find a way to be a model for civil discourse. And we thought there was really merit and value in that and to demonstrate respect to the other. The other uh, way to look at it in the clarity, well, who are we? We're a, a church that's rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we strive to have a well-formed conscience of the faithful and of our members. And hopefully they would have that in going into the arena that would add some clarity. And the last point, compassion. And I think if we, yes, I have to have compassion, but when I said about to have it, it's all about another. And it's about how I treat them, how I see them. Do I see them also as made in the image and likeness of God? So um, that idea of the pledge on those three points kind of, put the finishing touches on what was there and it was launched in that regard. I think it has got traction in society. I think, I know that in my own diocese, it does, but I think bishops just thought it was necessary. We have to stand up and say something simply because let's face it, all you saw was disrespect when you saw these individuals on a stage and they are human beings and we have to teach, we have to treat each other. And through that treatment on air, I think we have a, a responsibility to teach to generations coming up in the future. Who are we as men and women of God? 
Thank you, Bishop Dumain, and, and what a wonderfully clear explanation about um, you know, how, how we are called to engage as Catholics. Uh, Bishop Dorsonville, I wonder if we can turn to you next. Uh, you know, as chairman of the Bishop's Committee on Migration and Refugee Services, you are constantly engaging on the issue of immigration, which is one of those issues that can evoke strong reactions sometimes. How do you think that incivility when we hear it in public and private conversations as well, how does it affect our immigrant brothers and sisters? Yes, uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, just uh, listen to uh, Bishop Duane. He has been able to, to bring this solid uh, platform in order to continue to elaborate when uh, we're going to speak about the presence of immigrants and human people, brothers and sisters who are coming in a moment of need to our country, but also through the years, they have been able to incorporate and to give so much blessings and goodness and offer themselves to continue to build the, the society, the economy, the structures in our country. Then I guess we have been um, in certain way kind of misleading the subject about immigrants. Because when we speak about immigrants, I wonder if uh, the general public know that uh, around 280,000 undocumented people are already immersed in the healthcare component across the nation. And they are frontliners in this moment of uh, the pandemic and uh, with uh, such a sense of generosity and love offering care and taking care of those who are sick. I really think that that's just a minimum expression of seeing when we say, yes, they, uh, who are they? And uh, Bishop has, has said something very important. The compassion comes when we see not like a name, but a face. And we are able to go into the drama and into the life of a person. And we discover that there is a human person. It's a brother, it's a sister. It's someone who struggles, someone who really needs to, for us to give, to give uh, a sense of mercy, compassion, and express our solidarity. Why? because I know by fact that when we create that road, we will receive a sense of gratitude from immigrants. If we are able to give love, we will recover the sense of gratitude for the years to come. We will reap what we're going to sow. And I think that that's a very important point in the lives of so many children, so many families, that at this moment are just waiting for those who are going to walk with them, accompanying them, praying for them, and why not we need to advocate for them? Because we know them, and we know that they are essential for this society, that without them, we're going to be also in a very difficult circumstances. Therefore, I really think immigration is a blessing. It's a blessing for our country. It's a blessing for ourselves, their future, a, 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 solid, a solid future because most of them, or oh, why not we said 80, 90% of them, they share our faith, our belief, and they are inspired also in what we are inspired, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right there, I think that the, the, the solid component of the stage of how we're going to continue to rescue the sense of the dignity of the human person by humanizing the society that sees these people coming into our borders and why not into our country and to our systems, not to harm us, but to help us and to give us also a sense of collaboration, gratitude and love that always through more than 50 years, we have experienced in this massive a kind of immigration from Central America and Latin America that is a, a, the, the, the main component for DACA and TPS uh, uh, people 
who are more than close to 2 million people waiting for something to happen during this time. Thank you, Bishop Dorsonville. And I, I really appreciate that, that um, calling to mind how encounter and how hearing the stories and seeing the faces of our brothers and sisters um, can really highlight for us the dignity that every person has, that people aren't just part of some group um, over there, but they're, they're part of us and part of our human family. Um, so thank you for those beautiful words. I wonder if we could turn next uh, to you, Andrew. Um, we know that this Civilized Initiative originally came from the Archdiocese of, of Cincinnati, where you uh, serve under the leadership of Archbishop Schnur. Can you tell us a little bit more about the history of the Civilized Initiative and, and how it developed locally? Sure, absolutely. And thanks for having me here. Um, you know, every election cycle, we consider uh, how we're going to promote the important teachings that are contained within forming consciences for faithful citizenship. In 2016, it was decided that before we started uh, exposing people to the theology behind conscious formation and political engagement, parishioners really needed to hear from the archdiocese encouragement to use charitable behavior in their discourse. Uh, as has been mentioned previously, we noticed that in both public and personal conversations, it was increasingly difficult uh, to enter into fruitful dialogue and conversation with others. We also were concerned that the archdiocese would be just seen as one other voice in the din of political interest if we approach things uh, in the usual way. And not to mention the fact that we felt like that a distinctly Catholic perspective should have a place in the conversation in both political parties. Hence, we thought that if we could really lend something, excuse me, that we could really lend something to the political discussion if our first foot forward was a clarion call to oppose incivility and division. So uh, along with several offices, several offices in the pastoral center, the social action office, the uh, office for new evangelization and um, uh, the Office for Marriage and Family Life, we all teamed up and developed the Civilized brand. And then we partnered with a local marketing firm to develop the logo, the magnets, the t-shirts, et cetera. After that, uh, we had a gathering here in Cincinnati where we had representatives from about a hundred different parishes where we presented the concept and we asked them to promote it. Uh, thankfully, many of the parishes bought into uh, the idea and bought into distributing uh, the resources and sharing these ideas. Uh, our faithful citizenship presentations were modified to include the civilized message, and, and they really represented our deep dive uh, in our campaign to really more fully educate parishioners on the principles of civil discourse and the theology of faithful citizenship. Archbishop Schnur was fully behind the initiative. He wrote some op-eds, he provided video messages, et cetera, and we also uh, organized presentations around the archdiocese. Excellent. Well, thank you, Andrew. What a, um, an interesting history the initiative has. And I know um, on behalf of, of many Catholics around the country, we're grateful for the, the leadership of Archbishop Schnur and, and um, all of the staff and in Cincinnati for developing that and then sharing it um, with the conference to uh, implement nationally um, across the nation uh, during this election cycle. Um, Bishop Duane, I wonder if we could turn back to you for a moment. Um, you know, it strikes me that but um, some people, when we talk about civility, uh, can kind of confuse civility with simply accepting every person's opinion as valid, no matter what it might be. Uh, how is that different than what, what we're proposing with Civilize It? Yeah. Um, no, just because we say that, that, to listen to the other, that's not saying that your, your opinion becomes milk toast or whatever. However, I think what we have to understand is we have, we have roots on this. We go to say scripture, as the previous speakers have said, uh, for every point they've made, we can find it in scripture. And we have to, in a sense, root ourselves in who we are, have a certain clarity in when we speak also. And that relates to the form conscience that each of us are called to have, and that religious leaders are called to uh, help develop within a society. So I think we just don't have to disappear, but we have to know who we are. 
part of that also, I think, is um, listening to the other. You know, when uh, if I just pretend that uh, I, I know everything or the opposite side, the other one's always right. We have to be able to listen and find those points that we can dialogue on. And then within that context, turn back to the individual and say, um, you know, I, I did hear the points you made about, and there's going to be some common points, hopefully, and then move to where that difference is, to where, and I think we in church, we have a, sometimes a philosophical, a very different view of who the person is. So that idea of respecting and reaching out, hopefully that perks up that vision of made in the image and likeness of God, that we're able to rise out of that and treat others in the same respect. And in so doing, present our opinions, not that everything is equal, but that truly, as the previous speaker said very well, we have a contribution to make in this, coming out of our faith tradition, this whole debate, the whole political arena. Um, not that everything, unfortunately, is always gonna go our way, but we truly have a contribution to make. And we should feel that, make it, and listen to what the others, we may have to tweak some of what we say, we may have to, it may strengthen it. And so we then come back and speak with ever more, should I say, determination uh, to bring that gospel message into the arena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. And I, I think that will be helpful for our listeners too. you know, really that um, you, you've highlighted the importance of having formed consciences and, and knowing what we believe, and yet also being willing to engage in dialogue. I wonder if I could just follow that up. You know, are there any other kind of rules for engagement that you would highlight um, that that really helps to, to facilitate the type of civil dialogue? Um, and, and maybe, you know, also like how, how have you seen that that work in your own diocese? Okay, uh, I think we have to listen. You know, I think it's very strong. And if I don't understand, uh, I have to ask questions. You know, in a, in a, it falls upon both parties of the dialogue to get the clarity and see, set out from the beginning to, you called it rules of engagement. What are some guidelines that we can have here? And then to um, come to understand what, why would the individual have the viewpoints they do that might differ drastically from what we're saying in the context of our faith? So we would have to pay attention to those, the viewpoints, the motivation. Um, I remember one time I took a course that was on communication and listening, and it related to three points. When you say, I feel because, uh, I think that middle, what are the feelings involved there? What might motivate somebody? Uh, Bishop, you spoke so articulately about the whole idea of immigration, and we know what that can solicit to, from some people in a conversation, but why do they have that opinion? To come, I think we got to get an understanding. We have to see what are the feelings, what's behind what that person is saying, what has been their experience, and then try and move from that. Uh, in my own diocese, we've tried to with this whole civilize it initiative and the pledge, put it, we have something called the mustard seed and it goes out to announce events to parishes and it gives them bulletin inserts where they can then go online and well, Jill, they can zoom into what your office is doing by some things, particularly on this issue. And we, the parishes themselves have gotten in dialogue with each other on this whole initiative and they see the value for launching it. They see the value for they're inserting themselves into the political arena with that goal to civilize it, with the goal to uh, you know, give clarity to what's going on. And also, and this I'm very proud of them for, to demonstrate the compassion, to look to the other, what's going on here? How are we treating other individuals in our discourse? And sometimes when we listen to ourselves well, maybe not as well as we could. Yeah, thank you, Bishop Duane, both for those really practical tips and what you're doing in the Diocese of Venice, um, both, both very, very helpful. Uh, Bishop Dorsonville, I wonder if you'd like to talk about your experience from the Archdiocese of Washington, um, you know, how 
you know, you, you've really been a leader in helping Catholics to engage, um, especially on the topic of immigration, but other topics as well. Um, you know, how, how do you approach these sensitive topics? What best practices do you recommend? What have you seen that's worked really well? Yeah, thank you, Jill. Uh, as you know, uh, probably everyone knows Washington is a political town. And every single time that you go and as a uh, Bishop Dwayne is saying you spread the, the context of love, mercy, compassion. There are some people that say, ah, that's great, but the toughest way to see is how your discourse is going to affect the public policy. And right there, there is just one way to, to try to find, to push the engine, the Catholic engine or the faith in order to produce the miracle. First of all, I guess that we have to be conscious that we have a vocation, a vocation to be a holy person. What is a holy person? Holy person is the one who embraces the message of the gospel and tries to live it in the daily life in her or his home with those who are around that person that creates a new sense of culture which is in other words the relation that humans have along the history and uh, as much as we bring the good news of a man who was god this is jesus and we see that that gospel can be reflected on the faces of those that we encounter day on our daily lives. And we bring that kind of uh, uh, way to relate to each other, which is culture. Faith can transform culture. And if we try to transform that culture, the way that even our political leaders are going to see things is the reflection of the will of the people they serve. Then I don't think that it's just a matter of going and of course, politicians have a role as important, but also it's much more important to know that there are many bishops around our country, many faithful, many pastors, many priests, many religious sisters, many lady or deacons who believe in the respect of the human person. And as much as we can uh, bring that coalition together, it's just one voice that can conquer even the interreligious aspect of what we, we would like to share with others and with other faiths. Because I think that it's not only Catholics, the ones who are trying to find out how to humanize a little more our positions in a very, in a very difficult moments of uh, the life of so many people across the country. Then I guess that that would be some recommendations. We have lived life in parishes here in the Archdiocese, but the most important effect is when we just allowed people to relate to each other, to sit down, to talk to each other, to get to know better, to get rid of what they think it is, and just to confront the reality. And guess what? I never, never remember, I don't remember a day that someone told me, I, am, I was so disappointed to get to know this immigrant. Everyone comes and says, what a blessing, what a joy. I didn't know about this. This is just great. And the, the story, the way that they have been coming, the struggles, the, the passion, the love, for, is an inspiring point for many people who can be able to bring the good news because the most important point that has here is that we're people that live the sacramental life of the church. By that, we conquer our holiness and we're convinced that through holiness we can ask our Lord to make the miracles we need to make to happen 
in today's world. Therefore, it's not only up to us. It's not just a human engine that is going to produce results. We're people of faith, and faith really moves miracles in the middle of our ages. And I really think that that's the, 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 the beautiful aspect of doing something not only because we believe on this earth and on these years, but our minds also are set up in eternity. We are right here, but we are right in the other life. And I really think that is the newness of the real message that is going to conquer a wonderful immigration reform in our times. As much as we think about the social responsibility that we have in these 30 or 40 years that we are here, but also the eternity that is awaiting for us and how we conquer it by mercy, love, solidarity, and compassion. Thank you, Bishop Dorsonville. Um, and I, I really am moved by your um, articulation of um, this call to encounter as part of our baptismal call, as part of our faith. Um, thank you. That's uh, quite um, a, a beautiful thing to, to think about and to ponder. Um, I wonder, with that sort of in mind, if we can turn back to Andrew for a second, um, you know, we talk about um, this call of our faith to, um, to encounter, to love, to imitate Jesus. Um, and yet, uh, you know, as we are distanced from others during the current pandemic, more and more of our um, landscape is, is taking place online. Um, our interaction is on social media and other digital outlets. And I'm wondering, you know, Andrew, can you talk a little bit about how this invitation to civility and love and encounter, how can that impact our interaction online as well? Um, how, how can Civilize It help Catholics to, to really model a different way of engaging in that particular landscape? That's a, that's a great question, Jill. Um, you know, I want to introduce a couple or mention a couple of resources. Uh, first off, uh, the first one I want to mention is the USCCB's social media guidelines. Uh, this document offers a lot of really great uh, guidance. Um, a couple of key points, it cites um, Pope Francis and how he talks about uh, bringing warmth and stirring hearts, how we can respond with fresh energy and imagination as we seek the beauty of God. Um, it also cites Pope Benedict and how he talked about encouraging respect and dialogue and, and honest relationships, or in other words, true friendship. Another document, uh, the Australian bishops just put out a statement called Making It Real, a Genuine Human Encounter in the Digital World. And that document talks uh, or encourages us to think about the opportunities and challenges in this area. Um, you know, it points out that, that people move seamlessly between different forms of communication and across many of these forms, and especially with social media, there is the potential to facilitate real genuine human encounter and to serve as a powerful tool for evangelization. Now, of course, uh, when it is misused, it can bring out the worst in people and it can facilitate the spread of fear, anger, and disrespect. And unfortunately, it can be totally disengaged from the real human person on the receiving end of the comments that are made in, in vir virtual space. Uh, and this is where I think Civilize It is a great resource. Civilize It offers a wonderful chance to bring peace and compassionate inquiry into the world that will, God willing, um, that will spill over. Uh, these ideas will spill over into face-to-face -face communication, into print media, virtual chatting, and, and other forms uh, of communication. You know, the, uh, the digital world can be a place of communication, of encounter, and of solidarity, or it can be a place of hatred and quite frankly, sexual objectification, exploitation, bullying. Um, you know, when we're online, we can either encourage or demean. We can engage in meaningful discussion or unfair attacks. Uh, I think Civilize It here offers a guide and the tools to listen to our better angels. You know, often we, we can't see the other person with whom we're engaging, but we can uh, and should still be civil clear and compassionate. Mm -hmm. uh, the bishops of, of Australia in that document call us when we're online to seek to create spaces for encounter, to reject language and content that appeals to stereotypes, 
um, to actively promote and share the model of Jesus. And I think that Civilize It uh, really shows us how we can accomplish these goals, how, how we can be love, understanding, beauty, goodness, truth, and uh, trustworthiness, joy, and hope uh, online in this digital presence. People are really yearning for uh, the way forward, the path through which they can talk about their faith and have the tools to engage in uh, compassionate and civil dialogue. And I think Civilize It uh, does that. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew, for, for such practical tools and suggestions with how we can encourage that engagement online. Um, I wonder, you know, for Bishop Duane or Bishop Dorsonville, if either of you might have um, a suggestion uh, about language and how we um, can help to redirect conversations when we are hearing words used to describe others or certain populations um, that don't recognize a person's dignity or personhood. Um, you know, when we hear the, that type of language being used, um, how, how do you recommend that we respond? Bishop, why don't you go first? Yes, please, please, Bishop Dwayne. No, 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 you go. Okay, well, uh, just a, a, small, a small way for me to say when, uh, when people are referring to these people are criminals or whatever it might be the, 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 the way to refer to that. There are always questions to follow. Who are they? And do you have any statistical reports? Bring me numbers because we will be surprised when we say how many immigrant families we have around the country, around the world, and how many are kind of uh, misbehaving, and how many are working and trying to do their best. When we bring these two uh, levels, we understand why sometimes it's very difficult and perhaps a little dangerous to say that people, these people. And uh, I guess just a, it's a, it is just a, a story that I have in my ministry. When I came to the United States, uh, I went to serve as a, a parochial vicar in a parish. I was so happy and so impressed with the wonderful pastor who embraced me there. He never, ever spoke a word in Spanish. However, always when uh, he referred to the Hispanic community in the parish, he always said, our people. Meanwhile, sometimes uh, you can see that some priests always says, your people. But this man said, our people, why? Because is they're our brothers and sisters. We're the same. We're a flock, and we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Therefore, I guess that this is the kind of points that will instruct you, and uh, it's so right when uh, Bishop Dwayne says, you have to learn how to listen in order to find out a way to answer. Sometimes you don't answer because you are not listening well. Basically, that would be, I don't know if Bishop Dwayne has some other additions. Um, I might add something, but Jill, I'm going to go a little bit different direction, if that's all right. Sure. I was, I was recently out in a parish and gave a presentation. Recently, it's before the pandemic, so it's probably a while ago. And um, it was a presentation to be followed by questions. And anyone could ask whatever they wanted. It kind of, the questions were very direct. Um, you know, the church has gone through some struggles lately and people wanted to talk about those and we did. Uh, there was one individual who was very, let's say, she really targeted her questions, just zoomed right in. And she asked very intelligent, presented them well. Um, not always accepting the first pass at an answer, but come back and, but eventually, okay. And when it was all over and people, you know, thanked her, she, she stood up and said, 
you know, can I say something? She got the whole crowd's attention. And I thought, I don't know where this is gonna go. And um, as I noticed, she was a very articulate young lady. And she said, um, I have to say, I don't agree with everything that you said this evening. And everyone just kind of laughed because that was the obvious. <sighs> and she said, but I'm going to say one more thing. We are all richer because of the ideas, teachings, principles that you introduced into the conversation. She said, I think my position on some of it is very clear, but I've never heard some of what was said. She said, I didn't know that. So uh, her point was, and I think it's true to everybody who's to Andrew, to Bishop, to you, she was just saying, we're all the richer, even though I don't agree mm -hmm. with the richer that it's introduced into the dialogue. And I think that's important. Sometimes we think, well, it's gonna be a, a tough, tough one. Okay, it might be true, but I think we have to feel at the end too that we, and I've said it earlier and I truly believe it, we have a contribution to make. And if we make it well and do it, others will feel as this woman spoke, because clearly she didn't agree with a lot of what I said, but her compliment at the end and people broke into applause and I know I turned beet red, but <laughs> it was uh, very kind of her to say, and it was certainly, um, we have to speak up and we have to do it though in this civilized way. That's why civilize it, the whole initiative. And Andrew, you contribute a great deal having done it in a diocese and uh, you know worked with parishes and so on and so forth. You have an expertise on it that sometimes maybe this, it'll take us this whole year to get that. So um, just Jill to say thank you for convening this and remember everything we say they may not agree, but hopefully it makes a contribution. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bishop DeWayne, and, and what um, an excellent example of the power of encounter. Maybe just to, to kind of uh, wrap things up here, if I could invite you, Andrew, to just um, name a few next steps that Catholics can take. How can people get involved? What are some of your favorite resources available to them via Civilize It? Sure. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I think that uh, the USCCB, um, you, Jill, and all, the, all around you have done a fantastic job of building uh, on the ideas that Cincinnati developed four years ago. Um, you know, as far as a first step, quite simply, I'd encourage folks to visit civilizeit.org. Um, it, it is a, you know, we had a lot of resources online and we developed some tools here and there's, a, there's all that and a lot more on the website. Um, I guess when you come to the website, the first thing that I'd really encourage people to do is to familiarize themselves with those tenets, those ideals that have been mentioned several times in this conversation about civility, clarity, and compassion. Uh, there's some really good explanation of why we think those are the kind of three key uh, ideals in this. And then also I'd encourage you to take that public pledge uh, to, com to commit to these ideals. Uh, if you go to the page on the bottom of the front page, you can sign the pledge. And you can also see who's signed the pledge. And I actually checked this morning, and I think just this morning, we passed over 1,000 people that have signed uh, the pledge. So we've got a lot of people already that are committed to this, and that is just the ones who have signed the website. So to sign the pledge and, and make that commitment, and, and I think uh, there's a lot of value in saying something publicly, because then you're probably more inclined to hold yourself accountable to it, and others can hold you accountable as well, as they should. Um, after you sign the pledge, I really would encourage you to explore the different resources that are there. Um, within the website, there are resources for prayer, uh, for personal prayer, community prayer, uh, connection to the scripture and to the sacraments, and also ways to connect these ideas to the themes, uh, excuse me, connect these themes to liturgy. Um, there are also resources that can help you to reach out and encounter others. Um, there are tools for learning, and there are ideas about how you can act, how you can be engaged in service and in the relief work that our, that our community needs. Um, a couple of, ex, uh, of ex specific examples. There's a really great examination of conscience that's written up um, with these ideals in mind. Uh, there are some really concrete tips about civil dialogue. Uh, you know, uh, we mentioned earlier about how important it is to listen and to understand people, uh, to to come into a conversation with open hearts and open minds, even if they don't change your mind to have heard them. So somebody gets some really concrete tips um, for dialogue. And there's also uh, one piece that is 
far and away better than anything we could have done here is a really user-friendly research tool, a research search tool that's available. You can put in who you are, what your role is, what you're looking for, and it pulls up great resources around those different uh, roles that you might have. So I would really encourage people to look at that um, as well. And, and of course, back to my previous, the question I was asked earlier, um, given this reality we're in, almost all these resources can be adapted and used in uh, a virtual setting. And you know, beyond uh, reading and learning on the website, I would strongly encourage folks to bring these resources out to their communities. Um, you can share these resources and you can try to find ways um, to have these ideals and these tools incorporated into your parish and your school. Um, and, and, and you can use these tools, especially the prayers, as you talk with your family and your friends, as you talk with your neighbors and other folks online or on phone, or as you sit in your driveway and in social distance conversations. Uh, and, you know, as soon as we can safely do so, talk about these things around the dinner table. Uh, these are really practical and useful tips that really need to start in our small church and then kind of radiate out. And, and there's great ways, uh, great recommendations on, and resources uh, to do that. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew, for those very practical tips. Thank you, Bishop DeWayne and Bishop Dorsonville for your wisdom that you shared during this conversation. And thank you to all of the listeners. Let's get out there and civilize the conversation, uh, bring compassion and civility and clarity uh, to our families, to our interactions online, to our communities. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all.